Good morning, church. Happy, happy Sunday. And speaking of happy, happy birthday to my little girl, 13. Woo. I have a teenager. I'm getting old. And I have a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. Maybe more on the way. No announcement. I'm just saying. I'm so fired up. Y'all picked a great day to be here today. And we're starting a new series. But before we get started, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, make sure you all are good and awake, I want you to think of your all-time favorite rock band. Okay? All right? Don't say, if Louise is here, I don't know if Louise is here. I know she'd say Def Leppard, because that's her, that's her thing, right? But I want you all to think, okay? Now, depending on when you grew up, you probably think of your favorite group is sometime in your childhood, or maybe your teenage years, right? Think about it, right? Duran Duran, ABBA. Different things like, right? Right? Different things. What are you thinking? Okay, in fact, I'm going to count it down. Three, two, one. And at, when I get to zero, y'all shout out your all-time favorite musician, music group, band. You ready? Three, two, one. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see if anyone can, can guess these, okay? Because I'm going somewhere with this. This is going somewhere spiritual, believe it or not. How many people remember the original rock and rollers? Anybody remember these guys? Anybody know? Who are they? Chuck Perry and Buddy Holly. Who knew that? Nice, nice. Okay, we're the old ones, right? We get that. If you didn't go through the 50s, maybe you went through the 60s. Do you recognize these people? And? Oh, you're so good. Okay, all right. Let's move in. Music gets a little bit louder. Not much, but a little bit louder. We go into the 70s. Who do we like on this one? Oh, Missy Gill is fired up. Aerosmith and? Rolling Stones. Yes, yes. Some people say that the two lead singers are twins. But they're not quite, but you never see them in the same spot at the same time. That's why the, you know they're the same person. Now, from the 70s, we go to oh, the 80s. When, <laughs> that's it. When the music got louder and the hair got higher, right? I don't know who your favorite, maybe it was Van Halen. Maybe it was Cinderella or Poison or some of those or Motley Crue. For me, my two favorites were, hands down, Dokken and Striper. Yes. You should applaud that. That is worth it right there. Dokken and Striper. So imagine my sheer ecstasy and delight when it comes to pass that my all-time favorite guitar player, this demigod known as George Lynch, tags up with Michael Sweet, the greatest singer-songwriter guitarist in the world. These two get together and form a new band, a supergroup called Sweet and Lynch. Okay? Their very first song that they ever released, their very first hit, has these words. Walk with the wise and be wise. Run with a fool, never rise. Do what is right, lead the race, take the prize. Walk with the wise to be wise. That's Proverbs right there. In fact, let's just have an invitation and be going home. Because that is, that is it. That is deep wisdom. And today we are jumping on a new path on Proverbs. And it is so, so, so profound. If you haven't dived into Proverbs lately, I encourage you to do it. It is going to change the way you think. It will restructure your thought pattern and will truly make us wise. We're going to be basing this on the book of Proverbs. And it's inspired by a book called The Principle of the Path. Andy Stanley wrote this, Charles Stanley's great son. And he says, this is how you get from where you are to where you want to be. And he teamed up with Hal Seed, pastor of New Song Church out in California. And they had this phenomenal series. I don't know how long I'm going to go with this, but... I am so fired up because it is so profound today, and I want to share with you some practical, powerful truths of how you can get from where you are to where you really want to be. Because the way your feet are pointed dictates the direction you're going. If you don't like the way you're going, you need to change your direction, okay? I can want to go over there and see Tessa all day long, but if my feet are going this way, guess where I'm going? I'm going to Krispy Kreme. You got it, Jason. That's it, right? <laughs> Your direction is, is so important. That is what we look at. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when I go somewhere I've never been before, I want to have an idea. I want to have a heads up. I want to know a little bit about my destination. I don't have to know everything. If I'm going to see a movie, I don't have to know the whole plot. I don't have to know the characters. But I do want to know what I'm getting into a little bit. Is this an adventure movie? Is Amy taking me to see a chick flick? Amy, what have you drugged me into? Am I going to cry? Is this going to be one of those kind of movies? I have a reputation. 
Okay, we don't want, I'm not going to be bawling on that movie theater and, and ugly, cry. To, ugly cry. Hey, man, I resemble that. You want to know a little bit. So I'm not going to tell you everything, but I'm going to give you just a, a two minute bird's eye view, a little context of Proverbs. Because if you haven't studied it, you need to know why this stuff is so powerful. Proverbs is written basically by one group of people, but it's not the group you hear much about. The wisdom of ancient Israel was communicated on behalf of God through three groups primarily. The first one is one you've heard of, and it's the priests. These are the ones simply who give the law. Pretty straightforward. Most of us know that. The second group are the prophets. Ooh, you don't mess with the prophets. These are the ones that give direction and correction. Anybody like getting corrected? Isn't it fun? Isn't it great? But there's a third group. The group called the sages. The sages are the ones, they give the wise counsel. And the sages are the ones who wrote Proverbs. They wrote the surrounding books too, like Job and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, some of those, okay? They're the wise books. In fact, it's called wisdom literature for a reason. These are the books, if you want to be wise, you pour yourself into them. Now, what is wisdom and how is it different from intelligence? Wisdom is knowing how to respond with godly thoughts in everyday life, how to apply wisdom, how to apply God's truth, how to live that out. Intelligence simply means you know stuff, okay? They're not the same thing. You can have both, but most of us, if we're honest, we know somebody, maybe you got somebody in your family who's incredibly smart, but ain't got no sense. Know what I'm saying? They're, they're, some of you are laughing because they might be here. Don't, don't point to them. I'm just saying it. You can be really, really smart, but not have wisdom. They're not the same thing. Being wise is not like being smart. When we want to know how to be wise, God's word lays out a roadmap. The book of Proverbs was written primarily by one man, King Solomon. And he's known as the wisest man to ever live. Not only then, but now. He still stands the test of time. And here is what 1 Kings says, just a little background about Solomon. He says this. He spoke 3,000 Proverbs. We're going to go through all 3,000 of those today. And it's, <laughs> just making sure you're awake. His songs numbered 1,005. And he also knew about animals and birds and reptiles and fish from all the nations. The kings would send his people to go and learn and sit at Solomon's feet to learn this wisdom and bring it back to their kingdom. He was sought after. His, it wasn't like, hey, he's kind of smart. We should listen to him. It was like, you got to go. Pack your bags. I need you to go sit in Solomon's court and soak up some of this wisdom. This guy is a freak. He is, he is a beast of wisdom, and we got to tap into that. Would you go? And everybody looked. So if this was like modern day, he would have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in literature. He would have a doctorate degree in herpetology and ichthyology and biology and a whole bunch of ologies. We don't know what they mean. And on top of that, he would have a record deal because of all his songs, okay? He is that well-rounded. This guy was legendary. And I'll tell you maybe more next week or so how he came to have all this. He wrote most of the Proverbs. Of the 31 Proverbs, we know that Solomon wrote 1 through 24. Okay, so he wrote most of the book we're going to be studying, but he didn't write all of it. Proverbs 25 through 29 were compiled 200 years later by men in the day of King Hezekiah. And we know that because Proverbs 25 tells us that. The last two, Proverbs 30, was written by Agar, son of Jacob. And then the final one was written by King Lemuel, Proverbs 31. And everybody's heard of P31 women. It is beautiful. That is it. We don't know much about these guys, these last two. We know this. They're really wise. They are good, smart men, okay? So that's the background. That's the context. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 7 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the CSB translation. So if you can pick which translation in your portable device, scroll to the CSB and just kind of hold your place there. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. If you can't be here live, that's the next best thing. We pray God's word will speak to you today loud and clear. Proverbs 7 is about to tell us a story. It is a story of, mm, there's no other way of saying it, <laughs> seduction. It is a story of seduction, and we don't know if this is based on a true event that Solomon's watched, or if this is something he's made up to illustrate. It doesn't matter, but we do know this. We know he's crazy serious about this, because he begins with intense statements like, son, keep my commands, and you just might live. 
Son, write these on the tablet of your heart. Burn them in. Tie them on your finger like strings so you always remember. Son, if you don't obey, you're going to die. I mean, he's so intense through verses 1 through 5. And then in verse 6, he does something weird. He starts a story of seduction. And that's where we pick up the story. He's looking out the window. He's looking down the street toward the house of a known temptress. We'll just call her that, okay? Now pick up the story with me. Read verse 6. He says, at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. I saw among the inexperienced. I noticed among the youths a young man lacking sense. Crossing the street near her corner, he strolled down the road to her house at twilight in the evening in the dark of night. Uh-oh. Uh, something tells me this is not going to end well for this guy. You don't have to be a pastor or a rocket scientist to see something's off. Something is up. Just the way this is, this is described. The road you are on determines where you will end up. True enough? Straight enough? Everybody with me on that? If I want to go fishing, I'm a fisherman at heart. You know that. I love the heat. I love to get sweaty and sandy. And Let's say I wanted to go fishing, and I head out west on Highway 64. Okay, if I keep going, I'll cross over Jordan Lake, and if I keep going, I'll go through Pittsboro, and if I don't stop, if I'm lucky enough to make it, I will get to that honeymoon hotspot, tourist trap haven, Siler City. <laughs> okay, right? True enough? The road I'm on takes me to the destination. If I don't turn left or right, that's, I'm gonna end up in Siler City. Now, I can want to go fishing at the Outer Banks all day long. I can even put a little white sunscreen on my nose and a whole bunch on my head. I can grab my beach towel and my fishing pole and all that stuff that I, I have so much of, and I can start going with every intention of going to the Outer Banks. But if I head west on a high, Highway 64 instead of east, I'm going fishing in Siler City, right? Is the fishing good in Siler City? I don't know. I don't know. It's not good for me anywhere, but you get the point. If my intention is to go to the Outer Banks, but I still have my feet going this way, I have no one to blame but myself when I end up in the fishing mecca of the world, Siler City, instead of the Outer Banks. And that right there is our opening principle, the principle of the path. Your direction, not your intentions, will determine your destination. Live it out, write it down, take it in. Your direction, hear me, not your intention. No matter how much I want to go to Outer Banks, if I'm going this way, I am going to be, that is going to be my destination. And this is true whether it's my family life, or my financial life, or my marital life, or my dating life, or my spiritual life, or how I raise my kids, or my physical fitness life, or my professional life. This principle applies in every area of life. My direction, not my intention, determines my destination, okay? How many times, though, have you been talking to somebody, an adult, who's describing to you how their life just came off the rails, or how they got shipwrecked, and how many things went horribly wrong, and they're going through and they're talking about how their marriage blew up, and their kids are rebellious and resentful, and, or you talk to students and they're just stunned that they didn't get the grades they were hoping for, and in the back of your mind, you're kind of sitting here just biting your tongue going, didn't you see this coming? Did you not see this path coming a mile off? Because the direction you were, you weren't taking any steps to accomplish what you intended. How did you not see that coming? Now, of course, we're good Christian people. We don't say that. But in our mind, that's what we're thinking. And they're describing it. And you just want to say, guys, your direction was determined. Your intentions don't matter if you do not follow through. Take this one step further. We can have the best intentions. They can be good and godly intentions with the best thing, but we can still end up in the worst situations. And here's the deal, let's be honest, it could happen to sweet people, or rude people, or pretty people, or ugly people, or chubby people, or skinny people. It doesn't matter how sweet you are, how rich you are, how much mama loves you. All of us have the propensity to set a course we don't really want to end up at. Every one of us has the ability to choose a path that's not really where we want to end up. And most of those paths are a choice that if we just pull back and we have wisdom, we would see that the path I'm taking is going to determine where I end up. So with that as a background, remember verse 7 again. 
Solomon says, I saw among the simple, I saw this young man. He's a teenager, he's an adolescent, he's a youth. He lacks judgment. And he's going down the street near this lady's house, a corner. He's walking along, it's night, it's twilight, day's fading, dark is in. This guy is cruising the streets at sunset, headed in the direction. Now look what happens next. Look at verse 10. He says, a woman came to meet him dressed like a prostitute, having a hidden agenda. Remember that. She's loud. She's defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now she's in the streets. Now she's in the squares. She's lurking at every corner. She's everywhere. She grabs him and she kisses him. She brazenly says to him, don't miss this. I've made my fellowship offerings. Today I have fulfilled my vows. So I came out to meet you, to search for you, and I found you. I was, so, I was looking just for you. You lie. Woman, you know that's not true. But does the naive teenage boy see this? Not at all. To him, man, this is, this is a great day. He's looking forward. This is going to be a night of excitement. He's going to have an awesome time. And she, I, I love this. This is so, you got to think about this. The scripture says how she's dressed. We know her intentions. We know it's a hidden agenda. And the actual Hebrew means she is hiding her heart. She's guarding it on purpose so that this guy doesn't see that she's about to pounce and, and capture him like prey. Okay? That's what that actually means. And then it says she's restless. She's never at home. She's everywhere. But where she probably should be, hopefully with her husband, which we'll find out in a minute, she does have one. But the word is lurking. What a great word. She's lurking all over town. And then she grabs him and she kisses him and she does it brazenly. You know what that means? I researched it. That word means to lie with arrogance. To look somebody boldly in the eye and lie straight to their face, kissing them and saying, I'm looking just for you. And notice what she does next. She brings religion into her lies. You know what she does here? She says, she says I, I've made my offerings. I'm good. I got everything squared away with God. Oh, look, I've made my fellowship offerings. She's saying, look, little boy, I'm a nice girl. I'm not like one of those scary ladies in the night. I'm a good girl. I've been to church. Oh, I've, been, I've made my offerings. In fact, I got money. I, I poured out my offer. I, I don't need money. I'm not after your money. I'm after you. I just want you. You see, when she says she went to the temple, she says, I've already been to the temple. I've taken my sin bucket, and I've dumped it out on the altar. And me and God, we're squared away. You don't have to worry about nothing. I got this. We're... God and I, we're copacetic. I've been to the altar. Not only have I poured out my sin and emptied my sin bucket on the altar, I left a lot of money. I paid my offerings, my fellowship offerings. God and I are good. I've emptied my sin bucket, and now I'm ready to fill it back up with you. Now, if she had come up to him and said that, even a naive teenager with hormones raging would have said, mm, something not right. I'm backing out. Let's, let's, let's end this. But he doesn't. And you know what? It's not just the teenagers. Adults still get caught in this sin bucket mentality. Here she is talking to him, saying, I've come out. And then she, she flatters him. Look how she lies. I've come out. I was looking. I was so lonely. I've been so depressed. I've been here. I've been looking all over for you. I've looked here and high and low. And I saw you and I ran out to meet you. I was looking just for Where have you been all day? Now, if he was smart, he would look at her and say, woman, you lie. You are a lying liar who lies. You, are, you're not, you take your nattering nabob of negativity and go. I do not, I, I rebuke you. But he doesn't do that. Because unlike her, he's not wily and cunning and deceptive. He's clueless. And he's walking down a road that ends in death. And he doesn't even see it. It's so amazing. Solomon, I love what he, what, what he points here. He says, just a PG-13 warning alert, okay? She's going to, if the flattery hasn't worked, she's going to try to seduce him now by describing how luxurious her bed is, okay? It's strange to me because we don't really do this. Amy and I, when we were courting, I didn't tempt her with words like this. Look at verse 16. <laughs> Amy, I have spread coverings on my bed. Rich colored linen from Egypt. <laughs> Well, if it's from Egypt, okay, right? I mean, it's rich mahogany leather-bound books. And verse 17, he says, I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. What? 
sounds like a breakfast omelet. I just, I just don't get that. I mean, in my honeymoon night, if Amy had said, come here, baby, and she patted that, and I saw, like, puffs of cinnamon coming up, well, one, I'd be sneezing. But two, I'd be like, what is going on? But apparently, this is a tempting thing back in ancient Israel. This is a big deal. And so it goes deeper. Now, I'm going to do something. I have a word of caution for you, okay? Hear me. Mom and Dad, I know we have younglings here. We're going to do something I've never done before. We're not going to skip a verse, but I'm not going to read it out loud, and I'm certainly not going to put it up here, okay? Because this lady goes from PG-13 to a soft R rating for the next sentence, okay? So for the next 18 seconds, everybody look down in your own copy and read verse 18 silently to yourself, okay? Because in the CSB, it gets a little explicit, okay? And when you're done, just look up at me with a sheepish grin. Everybody got it? Oh, boy, y'all are wishing you brought your Bibles today, aren't you? Somebody sharing? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Those of you who did, you know what I'm talking about. The CSB is explicit, okay? I mean, it's using words like feasting and things till morning and, I mean, all kinds of stuff going on. And, okay, everybody got it? We now rejoin the story already in progress. Verse 19, look with me. It says this. My husband isn't home. He went on a long journey. He took a bag of silver with him. You know what that means? That means he's going to be gone a long time. He don't have, you don't have to worry about nothing. He's going to come home at the full moon. Y'all, this story has it all, right? It's like 50 shades going on up here. This is some crazy stuff. What a powerful truth. Here's what she's saying. We know right now who the woman is. We now know she's married. And now we know her husband, not only is out of town, he's going to stay out of town because he's got a giant satchel of silver with him. That's an indicator. He doesn't need to come back and get money. He's set for a month or two till the next moon rises. That alone should have stopped this young man in his tracks, but it didn't. And if we think back maybe to some of our less wise decisions in years, maybe you see a little bit of ourselves in here. Solomon, however, is still there. Remember, he's at the window. He's peering through the lattice work. And if, if this were a movie, <laughs> there was a soundtrack playing, you know what would be playing around? The theme from Jaws. <laughs> She's walking down the, seriously, right? He's walking down the road. Dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. Songs like, don't you do it. Don't you, you're going to need a bigger boat. Don't you do it. Don't you cut, turn around. Dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. Right? Right? <laughs> but he's got his headphones on. He's not listening to that. He's listening to Nickelback. And he's just like, do, 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 do. And he's just having, he, that alone tells you, just his musical, he's not, if he were listening to Striper, he would not have gone down the road. <laughs> Truth? But he's listening to Nickelback or Coldplay, and he's going this way, but the rest of us are hearing Jaws. Right? You know I'm right. Tell me you don't see this in other people's lives. Where you see somebody, and you're like, that's a danger zone. That's a danger zone. What are you doing? How do you not see it? So he's going down this road, and we see this. He is thinking this is just an isolated event. Disconnected from the rest of his life. But Solomon says, that's not an isolated event. You're taking a step down a path. And each foot you take takes you closer to the grave. Because he's going to describe what's at her house here in a minute. And it is frightening. But he misses it. Think about this. Apply this to our own life. We can see so easily in other people their mistakes. Their lack of wisdom. Their foolishness. Sometimes we miss the one right in front of us. And that's the hidden gem for us. So many times what is so obvious to everyone else, to all those watching, often escapes us. You want to be wise? Know this about ourselves. Know this. Solomon sees this different situation to I mean, totally, and he's watching the same event. He's here in Jaws. That guy's listening to Nickelback. And as they're walking to this house, look what he says next. Look at verse 21. She seduces him with her persistent pleading. She lures with her flattering talk. And he follows her impulsively. He doesn't even think. Impulsively like a what? An ox going to the what? Slaughter. Not just the late 80s rock band. He follows her to the place where they have their lives ended. A slaughterhouse. Think about that. 
And we're like, wait, wait, Solomon, are you sure about that? Because he's going to this lady. He's, this is going to be a party night. He's going to have a night of passion. It's going to be awesome. Don't you mean he follows her like a rock star going into a nightclub? Bass is playing, the lights are going. It's like, oh, he's going to the party. Yeah, who you go, boy? High five. No. He says, y'all, that is not what it is. The reality is you are going to your own slaughter. When you follow her way, and Solomon's not finished. <laughs> he has two more animal analogies. Keep reading. Look at the next verse. He says, like a deer bounding toward a trap until an arrow pierces its liver. Or like a bird darting into a snare. He doesn't know it will cost him $1.75. Oh, no? What's your say? His life. Think this is serious? This is, this is incredible. Just in case you didn't get the whole ox to the slaughter symbolism, he says, try this. How about a deer who's stepping into a noose and is bloodied with an arrow sticking out of its liver? That's pretty powerful, pretty graphic. Or a bird who's been caught in a noose and it's just flapping around trying to get out. Friend, have you ever seen one? They will do everything it takes to break loose of that trap. It is just powerful because he knows this young man is about to throw away his future. Because he's not just taking a step to an isolated event. It's a start down a path. And he's seen the end of the path and he says, don't do it. Don't go there. Trust me. That little thrill is not worth it. And I'm not just talking about sensual things. That thrill, that insatiable lust for you name it, fill in your blank, that better car, that new car smell. I gotta, man, I'm gonna swipe that, I'm gonna get some debt. Well, awesome. A bigger house, that longer hours of job away from your family. You, you fill in the blank. He's saying, don't do it. It is not worth it. It could cost you possibly your life. And then Solomon does something very strange here, very unexpected. He starts to talk almost in plural. And he pulls back as if he's shifting his gears to a broader audience, almost as if this next part is directed at you and me. And he says this, look at verse 24. He says, now sons, notice this, plural, listen to me. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray onto her, what's that word? Paths. And there's our word for today. Don't stray onto the word, the path. This is it. This is not a one-time event. This is a path. And then he goes with a very sobering observation. Verse 26, he says, For she has brought many down to death. Her victims are a few. Her victims are countless. You know what Solomon's saying? He's saying, listen, listen, teenager. I know you think this is just you and this lady. I know this temptation, you think this is brand new, it's exciting to you, but this is nothing new. This lady is like an open chasm, and people are falling into it. There's nothing new. This is a well-worn path. There's nothing new under the sun, and you may not see it. This may be new to you, but this path ends in death. If Solomon could call a timeout, call, y'all remember a fantastic show called Saved by the Bell? Anybody remember that? Remember Zach Morris and Kelly Kapowski and A.C. Slater, right? Anytime Zach got in trouble, he could do a timeout. He'd call a timeout. Everything paused, and then he looked at the camera, and he started to expound his wisdom. It wasn't from Proverbs, but you get the idea. And so Zach called a timeout. If Solomon could call a timeout right here, you know what he'd do? He would call this kid over, and he'd say, listen, buddy, come here. Come, come here. <laughs> no, don't look at the girl. Don't look over there. Look to me in the eyeball. I want to talk to you about something. Listen, I want to, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but there is nothing unique or special or rare about you or what you're going through. This may be new to you, and your heart may be racing, and you may be really tempted right now. <laughs> but let me tell you, we've all been there, and if I had somebody who could look into my eye like I'm doing to you and say, don't do it, I wish I would have listened. Because you think this is special. You think this is a well-worn path. And if I could get all my buddies come tell you their stories, you would think twice to not follow the crowd, to not be part of the herd. If you, trust me, the outcome is very predictable with what you're about to do. And it is not worth it. Sin always costs more than the price tag that's advertised. Always. You've probably seen that. If you've lived any length of days, you've been able to testify to that. She is not just capturing your imagination. 
She is writing the script for your life. And the script is, you're a dead man walking. Okay? That's powerful. And just to drive home his point, he untimes out, and he goes to verse 27. He says, friend, her house is the road to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. A road to Sheol. Think about that. You know what that is? My highway to hell. This is, this is it. This is where ACDC got their inspiration. Right here, when he said, you are going to a road to Sheol, it ends here. It's not pretty. This is a five-lane interstate with the little diamond hove lanes on the left where you could go 1,000 miles an hour. And, and he said, I know where this road ends, and I trust you are not going to like it. It ends in death. This road is not where you really want to end up. There's a disconnect here, okay? And you've seen similar disconnects in people around you, and so have I but they've missed it. And sometimes we miss our own because we don't have a friend close enough that we've given permission to say, hey, I love you, but I think you have a blind spot here. Do you have anybody like that in your life? Man, we need that. We're not meant to walk alone. So everyone has the ability to choose the right path and the wrong path, to lead us where we want to go and where we really don't want to go. So how does this disconnect look in the real world? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna paint a few stories for you, okay? And just so you know you're safe, because it is the potter's hand, I'm not talking about any of us. <laughs> okay? These are, I'm serious. These are hypotheticals, but maybe this will help you identify, okay? For instance, here's how a disconnect can look in the real world. A single woman says, I want to meet a man, a good and godly man, and one day I want to marry him, a great Christian guy who's really got his act together, but then she settles for anyone and everyone who asks her out. If he's just like remotely cute. <laughs> if he's not a toad, I'll say yes and I'll go. The single guy says, I want to have an awesome, inspiring, awesome, passionate love life once I'm married. So he holds nothing back with every girl he dates along the way. My intentions? The path I'm on. A married woman says, man, I want to have a great relationship with my husband. Just a fantastic marriage where everybody looks up and they emulate it and it's just an awesome relationship with my husband. But then she puts the children a much higher priority over him every day. The married husband says, I want my kids to respect me as they grow up, to look up to me as a leader. And then he disrespects his wife and openly flirts with every other person in the neighborhood in front of his kids. Doing it not in front of your kids. A young Christian says, I've seen the light and I want to develop a deep and lasting friendship with Christ. I want to live for him. I want to make my days count. So he gets up every morning faithfully and reads his social media feed. Intentions? True path. The working man says, you know what? I want to grow old and I want to invest the latter years of my life and pour them into my grandchildren and mentor them. But then he neglects his health. The regular guy says, you know what, I want to get in shape. I want to lose weight. I got to look better. I got to feel better. I got, hey, can you supersize that? <laughs> Intentions? Reality. I want to go this way, but my feet are pointed this way. The couple says, you know what, we want our children to get plugged in, to develop a personal relationship with God, to choose friends and surround them with, with people who are like-minded, who've done the same thing. And then they skip church every other weekend and head to the beach or play softball or sleep in. Intentions? Reality. Newlyweds, so in love, they believe God has given them every good thing in their life, and rightfully so. They believe he's given them their marriage, their job, their income, their house, everything, and they determine together to be financially secure by the time they reach their parents' age. But then they adopt a lifestyle that's sustained and financed by debt, and they never honor God with their money. They spend every penny the Lord gives them on themselves. My feet are going this way. I intended to do that. They don't diverge. They, they, don't, they don't come together. And the list could go on and on. And these people, some people even have good intentions. These are great things. But like the naive boy in our story, their path they chose took them to a different place than they totally wanted to go, somewhere entirely different. And guys, this isn't, this isn't rocket surgery. <laughs> you were listening. It's not brain science. See what I did there? These are, we shouldn't need someone to connect the dots. 
If you want to drop two pants sizes, you don't eat three meals a day at Krispy Kreme. This is not rocket surgery. This is so simple. And here's the deal. Most of us miss this because it's about ourselves. If we want to be faithful in our family, if we want to be faithful to our spouse, we don't linger in online chat rooms and hang out on Tinder or FarmersOnly.com or any of those <laughs> wonderful sites. Those aren't pastimes. Those are pathways. And every path leads somewhere. And they miss it. And we laugh. And we think it's somebody else. And, 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 and I know it. I can see it in your eyes. Right now, you've got somebody in mind who you just wish was here today. You just wish, oh, man, so-and-so needs to hear this so badly. Unless we always think it's about the other guy. Let's bring this home, okay? Because you know there's going to be a challenge, and I'm your friendly neighborhood pastor, your neighborhood mayor of Realville, and we're going to bring this into the real world here, okay? And I want to ask you a couple questions. Are there any discrepancies in your life between what you desire with your heart and what you're doing with your life? The good news is it's not too late to change it. You have the power. The Holy Spirit is the one that breaks those bondages of sin, those chains that we talked about in Psalms 2 and 3 today. All of those things, he has the power. When you take that step every day this morning, you, you are on a financial path today, right now. You are on a family path right now. You are on a spiritual path. You are on a moral path. You are on an ethical path. Do you like it? Is it good? If so, awesome. Keep going down that road. If not, change it. You have the power to do it. In fact, I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. Do you like it? Is the path you are on a good and godly path? So I want to say something here. This is a hidden truth grenade because I want to do, give one grenade each week. How come this young, naive boy doesn't see what's coming? How come he doesn't see what is so clear to everyone in this room? You know what the answer is? This is so powerful. He doesn't think it's a path. He doesn't think this is a path. He thinks this is a one-time event. <laughs> I'll just do it this once, but never again. Oh. Man, it's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> am I the only one sweating? This is, this is, I probably am the only one sweating, because some of you look cold. I'm sorry about that. By the way, by the way, it is colder in the back than it is in the front. We did a test. It is almost five degrees warmer on the front row than the back row. So y'all, you back row Baptists, y'all come start sitting up here if you're hot. <laughs> this is where you want to be. And hippity flippy, flip it up, okay? Because the way the air flows, you're going to be colder back there than you are up here. True story. I am not lying. I'm serious about that. Just wanted to let you know. This guy doesn't see this coming because his path, he thinks it's an isolated event, disconnected from the rest of his life. Do you see the disconnects? These disconnects are things that we, if we would only remember that our direction, not our intentions, are determined by the steps we take, the things we do. So let me challenge you with these two questions to take with you to leave today. Question one, what direction are you headed in today? What direction? Morally, spiritually, relationally, with your family, your friends, financially. Those are the biggies. There's others. But these are the biggies. What direction are you headed? I challenge you sometime today, before you go to bed, talk with your spouse. If you live by yourself, talk to yourself. <laughs> and ask yourself, self, what path am I on here? Do I like it? Is it a good and godly path? If not, change it. For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about how to change that. Question number two, when you need to, how do you know to choose the right path? I'm going to give you two answers that you can take with you right now. The first one. Get wisdom. That's what Solomon's whole admonition is. Son, get wisdom. Write these sayings on the tablet of your heart. Burn them into your brain. Don't forget them. Bind them to you. Reading Proverbs will increase your wisdom quotient, guaranteed. There's 31. 31 Proverbs. Most months have 30 days, 31 days. If you read one a day, it will change your life. Billy Graham does this every day until he went to be with the Lord. This was his practice. When I found out about this as a teenager, I started to adopt this. Every day, read a proverb. If you want to get through Psalms, and you read four Psalms a day, and you'll get through that in a month too. Read a proverb every day, and you will start to put new grooves into your brain, new paths. And you will have godly wisdom every time. Remember this, a proverb a day keeps the stupid away. <laughs> True story. I made that up. A proverb a day keeps all the foolishness in our life away. It would keep us away from the temptress. 
It would keep us away from making poor choices. It will keep us away from debt. It will keep us away from you fill in the blank. A proverb a day keeps the stupid away. I should have made that a lyric for you there, Ryan, to put up. But y'all can tweet that out later. Number two, get in a small group. What? I didn't see that one coming. Get in a small group. We had the new building open today next door, and those rooms were overflowing. It was crazy. Let me ask you this. What would this guy in this story today, how would his life be different if he had a friend close to him that said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? If, if the guy was looking through the lattice and he sees he's walking to a really bad place, he would have busted down the stairs, knocked the screen door off, says, ho, 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 ho. You're not thinking. Come here, come here. Do you have anybody in your world that you've given authority and power to speak to that? To say, what, what are you doing? Don't, someone who would have rescued him before he even got to the woman's house, his whole life would have been different. We need that. We were never meant to be an island. We were never meant to walk this alone. And if this is your only meal a week, you're hungry. You need that. As great as the large group is, and it is awesome, and we need that. So we all hear what God's play is. We call the huddle, and then we break, and we go reach the world. But we need to have those. In there. The bigger we grow, the smaller we go. And that's why you want to plug in. And if you're interested in this and you don't know what to do, see me, see Jason, see Ryan after church, we will help you get plugged in. Some meet on Sunday mornings, some meet during the week, some meet here at night, some can meet in homes, some can meet at restaurants. I am praying for God to rise up two or three more small group leaders over the next few months as we relaunch small groups and refuel in the fall. Is that you? Somebody in here, you've been waiting. We need leaders and we need people to plug in, to attend, people to help mentor. This is a huge step towards staying on the right path. We're not meant to do this life alone. And these small groups are a great place. Plug in and let God's wisdom read those Proverbs every day. All right, will you pray about that? Let me pray for you now, bow with me. God, I thank you for the power of your scriptures. I thank you for the truth and the wisdom found all over Proverbs and Job and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and all these wisdom books of the sages. God, help us to do more than just read them. Help us to take them into our hearts, to, to write them literally on the tablet of our heart as you admonish us to. Lord, we don't want head knowledge. We want you to change our hearts. So God, as we, as we linger in your presence today, as we, as we sing another song, as we, as we worship you before we go, would you remind us what our next step needs to be? Meet us here and now in this moment. We love you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. It's in your powerful name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.